Revelation uh, chapter 1, and we're going to begin in, uh, in verse 10. Uh, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Okay, and so this is John. It is Sunday, uh, the day that the early church recognized as the day to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Each week, the first day of each week, the early church would acknowledge that day as Resurrection Day. It's the day of the Lord, Resurrection Day. John is worshiping uh, when the Lord takes him up. Uh, some translations say, uh, on the Lord's day, I was wrapped up, okay? Um, he was raptured. Uh, this is the first of four catching ups uh, that John is going to experience and write about in the book of Revelation. So he says, um, I was uh, caught up, okay? And this is again, while he was on the island of Patmos where he's been exiled because of his declaration of Jesus as uh, the Christ, he says, I was in the spirit when I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Okay. And he heard this command and the command was, John, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. Okay. And then he uh, names the seven churches. Now it's important to keep in mind that this is a letter. Yes. To seven literal churches churches and yet that number seven means whole or complete and so even though this is a letter to seven churches it is also a prophetic document to the church as a whole okay and the writing to these seven churches uh Jesus is addressing the entire church uh, I should also note uh, this isn't the only letter to churches that we have in the New Testament. There are several letters. In fact, Paul himself wrote uh, seven different letters to seven different churches. But this is the only letter to the church from Jesus himself. So the churches are Ephesus in Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. So a voice comes from behind him. He turns to see the voice. And the first thing that he sees is the seven golden lampstands. This is crazy. This is wild. Um, and, and the reason why this is so big is because oftentimes we think that John turns and sees Jesus. Usually this is how this is taught. We, we read the text and we, we glance right over the lampstands and we go right to uh, Jesus. But the first thing that John, see he hears the voice, okay, comes behind him. John, write down what I'm about to show you. He says, I turned to see the voice and I saw the seven lampstands, which are the seven churches. He turns to see the head, but the first thing that he sees is the body of Christ. And this is what we talked about last week. The, the, the holiness, the sacredness that is the church, the ecclesia that belongs to Jesus, that Jesus said to Peter on this rock, I will build my church. That the church is the idea of Christ. It belongs to him. His commitment is that he would build his church. And so um, when you look at the model that Christ has established, the way that Jesus reveals himself on the earth is firstly through his body, okay? John first saw the body of Christ, and then he's going to see the head of Christ. So the study of the church and the ecclesia, okay, uh, having good ecclesiology, which is our understanding of the operation of the church, that was last week, and if for some reason you weren't here last week, maybe you're new here, uh, all this is on YouTube, uh, so go and watch it. Um, this is such an awesome journey into the revelation of Jesus, the Holy and Anointed One. 
Now think about this for a quick second. Um, we, we, so many times we separate the head from the body. We separate Christ from the church. We say it's not about the church, it's about Jesus. But there is no separation in this first vision uh, that when John sees uh, Jesus, he first sees the body and then he sees the head. Hallelujah, we don't have a God with a severed head. Hallelujah, we have a Savior who has a head and a body. So we looked at the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the ecclesia last week. Uh, tonight we're going to look at the revelation of the head, the revelation of Jesus. This is so awesome. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, all right, let's get on with it, Darren. Let's, <laughs> right? Let's, let's, let's read the book, Darren. Okay, we're going to. Um, but before we do, I'm going to set this up for you out of the book of Daniel. And we're going to look at Daniel's vision of the coming Messiah. Uh, every uh, Jewish uh, person would know the scroll of the prophet uh, Daniel. And they would know the capturing of the vision uh, that Daniel sees. This was such a significant vision and series of visions. Uh, that Daniel had because just like the early church, okay, um, uh, uh, after the resurrection and ascension of Christ faced tremendous persecution, the same thing is true of the Jewish people in Daniel chapter 7. The fear for the early church is that they're about to get squashed and that they're going to become extinct. The same fear in the same context is true within the context of the Jewish people in Daniel chapter 7. And that's where the Jewish people, they were given the, uh, the promise. That's echoed throughout the prophets, okay? Uh, but this is the promise of a future and a hope made possible through a coming Messiah, right? And, uh, and he's going to usher in uh, what the Jewish people uh, saw as the fullness of the kingdom of Israel. And of course, Jesus is going to frame that a little bit differently. But Daniel 7 is a big deal. And I want you to see the revelation of Christ to the Jewish people as it was given in Daniel 7, uh, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to align with Revelation 1. Uh, Daniel 7, he says, and I watched till thrones were put in place, he says, and he describes a Messiah as the ancient of days. And his garment was white as snow. And his hair was like pure wool. Okay? And I was watching. This is verse 13, Daniel 7, 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Very interesting. This is uh, Messiah, okay? And this would be God made flesh, a Son of Man. Very interesting. Uh, coming with the clouds of heaven, right? And so right, you're immediately seeing all the parallels between Daniel 7 and Revelation 1. We, we read in Revelation 1 where John says, and I see him coming, coming on the clouds. Every eye will behold him. Daniel says, and he came to the ancient of days. Verse 14, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. All right, so now let's go Revelation 1. And uh, today we're going to pick it up in verse 14. All right, we're going to begin in verse 14. Look at how uh, Jesus is, uh, is described. And then we're going to look at where Jesus is, what is Jesus doing in this revelation of the Christ. Uh, as it's unrolled in the first catching up of John, it is going to blow your mind. All right, uh, verse 14. Uh, the hairs of his head were white like wool like snow. Sound familiar? 
This is, this is a line. The Jewish people would say, this is the one. This is the one that Daniel spoke of. Uh, this, is, this is Jesus uh, uh, unveiled without, uh, without, any, without any censorship, okay? His, the, the hairs of his head are white like wool. This is speaking of his immortality, okay? Of his wisdom. Uh, his hair is white speaking of his purity, right? Speaking of his divinity, Okay, John looks at Jesus, okay, and he sees him in a, in a white robe, okay, purity, with white hair, with a gold sash, right? And, uh, and there's, there's something that is, uh, uh, you know, it's obviously, he, he's a man, okay, but there's, uh, there's something very lamb-like in his nature, uh, indicating, okay, this is not 30-year-old Jesus. This is not 33-year-old Jesus. This is Jesus, the Ancient of Days. This is Jesus, the, the, old, the, the oldest, whoever was, he was there in the beginning, and yet, as uh, Crowder says, and yet he was as young as a toddler. He's, he's as old as, 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 as anyone living in a rest home, okay, <laughs> and as young as a newborn baby, the ancient of days, the pure. It is Jesus. It's, it is the divine, okay? His, his hair is white. Now, look at this contrast. His, his, his hair is white. It's full of wisdom, divinity, uh, purity, and innocence. And yet his eyes were like flames of fire. Uh, that when he looks at you, he looks right into you. Right into the core of who you are. Uh, his eyes are filled with discernment. His eyes are filled with righteous judgment. No facade, no performance uh, can, can, can protect you from him seeing down to the very core of who you are. He looks at you and with one glance he sees the, the record of your beginning to the record of your ending, okay? Um, his eyes are like torches, okay? Uh, Daniel talks about this in, uh, in Daniel chapter 10. I'll read the text here uh, in a second. And you know, a lot of times when we think of, of fire, we think of, of hell and, and damnation and hellfire. But uh, it's interesting. The fire of God, it does not come to, to destroy. You know, I think a lot of people think that fire destroys things. But uh, I think that a lot of scientists would actually say what fire does is it, it simply realigns the molecules of, of, of creation, right? The fire of God, it does not come to destroy us. The fire of God comes to refine us. Uh, a lot of people think in terms of, of, of punishment, that the fire of God comes to punish us. But the, the truth is, is that the fire of God um, comes to purify us. It comes to realign our priorities, okay? Um, we see that the, that the fire of God is not ultimately uh, Okay, so punitive, following that track, you hear the word judgment. And immediately you think that, that Jesus, the judge, is coming to punish everybody. But when we speak of his judgment, we are speaking of his justice. Okay, and when we speak of his justice, we are speaking of King Jesus returning to wage war, not ultimately unto humanity, but to judge the real enemy, okay, which is uh, uh, Satan. It, it is uh, the power of death, okay, it is the power of sin. These principalities and, and powers, these cosmic bullies, if you will, uh, that have that have harassed humanity uh, since the fall in Genesis chapter 3. That King Jesus, he returns with white hair, with fire in his eyes, full of discernment, full of wisdom, full of judgment, which is his justice. And all of this, believe it or not, is coming from his heart, which is a heart of love. Song of Solomon talks about the fire of God. And it's, and it's such a beautiful beautiful text. It doesn't, it doesn't catalyze fear at all. It actually uh, stirs up a tremendous 
intimate, white-hot zeal and a very hot intimacy between the bridegroom and the bride. This is Song of Solomon chapter 8, verse 6. You're going to start to think of fire differently. You're going to start to think of the fire in his eyes differently. You're going to start to, you're going to, start to think about his judgments differently. You're, you're, you're not going to be afraid of his judgment. You're going to fall in love with his judgment. You're going to fall in love with his justice because you know that, that when you say, come Lord Jesus, that when you picture him coming, he's not coming with a big wooden paddle to spank you. He's coming with the sword coming out of his mouth um, to judge these, uh, like I said before, these cosmic bullies that have harassed our generation's going back to Adam. He's coming to cut off of us every weighty, every carnal, uh, 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 every uh, generational aspect of our humanity that is foreign to his original intent that we see within Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Song of Solomon chapter 8 verse 6. Set me as a seal upon your heart okay as a seal upon your arm for love is as strong as death jealousy is fierce as the grave its flashes are flashes of fire the very flame of the lord you see uh, the fire of god is not his destructive wrath poured out upon you the fire of god is the fire of his jealous love that is pouring out of his eyes his pursuit of his bride it is the fire of his intimate white hot love that there is no place that he longs to be then with his bride. The day will come when he comes leaping over the mountains, when he comes in hot pursuit of his bride to come and to bring us back to his heart. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your, your, your hot, passionate, intimate love for your church. And, uh, and again, uh, if, if you are part of the bride, part of the church, uh, you should not fear his fire. You should welcome his fire. You should not fear his, uh, his judgment. You should welcome his righteous, holy justice in your life. Come and judge uh, everything that is in my life that is not of you, King Jesus. I trust you. I love you. Come and cut it away in your love for me. <sighs> All right, here we go. Let's keep going. We're going to go a little deeper now. I mean, we're already uh, over our heads, but let's go deeper. Um, verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. Okay, this is an alignment with the vision that Daniel receives. It's recorded in Daniel chapter 10, verse 6, where it says his body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches. There it is again. Okay, uh, his arms and feet like burnished uh, bronze. Okay, bronze speaking of one of the, the heaviest of metals that, that his feet are, are firmly grounded in place that, that he is the unmovable Savior. Uh, verse 16, in his right hand he held the seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was the sun shining in full strength. Really interesting there. Uh, you'd think that the sword would be in his hand. Uh, that's the way by which humans wield violence with their sword. But this sword is the sword of the Lord, and it's coming from his mouth. Our Savior operates differently. Okay? He is not coming back uh, in violence. He's coming back in, in his justice. In verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, and he said, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forever, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Okay, this is Jesus. Uh, this is him saying, 
don't be afraid. You know me. We are friends. I'm coming to you in a different way. And this is Jesus testifying of his uh, divinity that during this time uh, within the Greek culture, you have a plethora of legends and tales about the gods. Okay, um, One of these gods is the god of Hades, which is um, the deity that resides over the realm of the dead. Okay, And uh, this is where when Jesus is talking about the church, you'll remember this. That when Jesus says to Peter, uh, on this rock I will build uh, my church and even the gates of the deity who oversees the realms of the dead. Okay, this, is, this would have been seen in the ancient times as the God of gods. Uh, that, there, that, that death would be seen as the, the most feared God. The, 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 the deity of, of Hades. Uh, even within Greek legends, uh, there would be those gods who attempted to go into the gates of Hades to rescue uh, their, their love, to rescue uh, various ones, okay? Uh, but the gods were never successful in, in, in attempting to defeat the deity of Hades. This would have been, uh, death was, was feared. It was, death was feared by the, the Jewish people. There wasn't, there wasn't a concept of, of, of heaven. There wasn't a concept of, of, of a father making a place for you in, in, in eternity. The, these concepts didn't, they didn't exist. Death was feared. It was feared by, by everybody. Um, and now here is Jesus saying, I am the one who was, who is, and is to come. And he says, I am the only one that has the keys. This is 18. I am the living one, okay? I died, Okay? And behold, I'm no longer dead. I'm alive. And not only am, am I alive, but because I have overcome death, I will never die again. I have the keys to death and Hades. Imagine being the early church. Imagine those who are giving their lives. People are dying every single day. Uh, thousands of believers are being executed and martyred because of their, 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 because of their faith in, in Jesus. And, um, and this doctrine of the resurrection of the dead is so incredibly new. They don't have a revelation of heaven. There, has, there hasn't been 80, 100 books published on the afterlife, okay? There was no Sid Roth at Supernatural, okay? We take all of this for granted. At this time, they are facing death daily, and death is seen as the most terrifying of things that can happen to you. And Jesus says, John, don't be afraid. I have conquered death. I have the keys to death and Hades. This would have been such a, uh, such a huge, such a tremendous gift to the body of Christ uh, as the seven churches here, don't be afraid. Don't fear death. Our Savior, Messiah, Jesus has conquered it. Verse 19. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, those that are to take place after this. And then he explains, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you see in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay. So now let's go to the beginning when John is going to turn around and he's going to see Jesus for the first time. So let's go to verse 12. Okay? Um, uh, we described what he looks like. We described his hair. Uh, we described his eyes. Okay? Uh, we described his, his feet being like bronze. Um, man, such a beautiful revelation of, of Jesus. But, but where is he? Okay, and what is, he, what is he doing? Back to verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw the seven golden lampstands, the church. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man. All right, uh, most people, when they read the book of Revelation or when they sing about the book of Revelation, it's usually the same. Uh, we see Jesus as king seated on his throne. 
Okay, um, but John is, 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 is having this encounter. The first thing that he sees is the seven lampstands. And there in the midst of, of the lampstands is Jesus, okay? And it says, I see him, right? And it says that he is one like the son of man, right? This is not just, the, not just a, um, a, a divine a uh, hologram, okay? This is the one that humbled himself to the form of a servant. This is the Christ who was born to the Virgin Mary. And he's not sitting uh, on a throne. In fact, he's not dressed uh, like, like a king. Um, he's standing, okay? And this is a big deal. Why? Because again, most people, when they engage the book of Revelation, it's Jesus the King, right? Jesus on the throne, right? When you think of Revelation, you think of the throne room, okay? Everybody immediately thinks of that. But the very first revelation that John receives of Jesus, uh, he does not present himself as a king. And this is just, ah, my Lord. Okay, so then, so then how does he present himself? Okay, he's, he's dressed in a long robe, okay? And what does he have around himself? He's, he's got a girdle on, okay? He's got a priestly golden girdle around his chest. So, um, so what is this? Uh, he is not presenting himself to John as Jesus the king. He's presenting himself to John as Jesus the high priest, okay? The first revelation that John gets is of the church and in the midst of the church, in the midst of the seven churches, is Jesus, our high priest. Okay? Um, this immediately takes us to Hebrews chapter 7. And I'm going to read this to you, uh, beginning in verse 21. But he, speaking of Jesus, became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord is sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. And because of this oath, Jesus has become the grantor of a better covenant. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in their office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. This is incredible. Jesus, the immortal. Jesus, the eternal. Jesus, our high priest, who is able to completely save those who come to God through him, not because he's just sitting down, chilling all day. No, Jesus is working. Jesus is interceding for the seven churches. Jesus is interceding for the body. Jesus is interceding for you. I'm going to keep reading uh, verse 26. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Nope. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men in all their weakness. But the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. So uh, John is seeing Jesus, okay? And believe it or not, he, yeah, his eyes are like fire. His hair is like wool. Okay, he's got a sword coming out of his mouth. Um, all of these are, are metaphors, of course. Okay, he's trying to describe um, what he is seeing. And yet he is still seeing Jesus in human form. And he's seeing Jesus doing something, okay? Uh, Jesus isn't sitting down, okay? Uh, he's not sitting down in the throne. He's not dressed up uh, like a king. And, and you'll say, why isn't he sitting, you know, what's going on here? 
What's, what's he doing? Uh, it's, it's fascinating. When you study the temple, uh, uh, in the temple, there wasn't a chair for the priest to sit down. In the Holy of Holies, there was not a chair for the priest. There was no provision of seats in the tabernacle or the temple. And the reason for this was it was believed that the work of a priest was never done. That a priest would constantly be serving. Uh, They would have to constantly be offering sacrifices every day to attend to the service of God in the holy place. It was said that priests don't sit. This is incredible. Uh, Why? Because yes, is Jesus king? Absolutely. Is Jesus seated on the throne? Yes, absolutely. But the text begins in Revelation chapter 1 where John speaks to the church that we are being fashioned and formed into a kingdom of priests. That in accordance with the order of Melchizedek, in Christ Jesus, we are both priests and kings. And this is such an amazing revelation that John is going to turn to hear the voice. And as he does, he sees the bride. As he does, he sees the body. And right there in the midst of of the body, okay, because the body and the head are one. Christ and his church are one. And there in the middle of the seven churches is Christ Jesus Christ our high priest, and he is standing, and he is serving. And who is he serving? He is serving the church. He is serving his body. He is taking care of his bride. He is actively and intimately at work. And the book of Revelation is the proof that Christ so loves his bride. Jesus so loves you that he gave his life for you yep but he has also given you this love letter the book of revelation is an intimate love letter this is who i am this is who i am in you this is who you are and this is unveiled look at my job description in the heavens that even now Christ Jesus is serving as a priest, loving his church, serving his church, um, uh, washing his body in the water of his word. Jesus loves you. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again for his girl. Jesus is coming again for his bride. Jesus is coming for you. And you do not have to wait until you die to see his eyes of fire, to fill his heart that is beating with love and affection for you. You can believe in your heart. You can confess with your mouth. You can, you can turn away from this world to turn and see his voice. You can turn from the selfishness of religion. You can turn from the selfishness of the new age. You can turn from the selfishness that is Eastern mysticism. You can turn from the selfishness that is uh, atheism. You can turn from whatever has been your, your idol, whatever has been your addiction, whatever has been your vice, whatever has been the end of you, you can turn from that tonight. You can turn and see his voice. Uh, uh, you can see Jesus tonight. In fact, you already have been, as we have been reading his word, you've been seeing this imagery in your heart. You've been seeing his, his eyes of fire. You've been, uh, as we were reading through it, you, you could see something in your mind's eye. You could see something appearing in your heart. And my friends, that is Jesus. That is, that is the God of Genesis. That is the God of the Old Testament. That is the God of the New Testament. That is the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. A God of mercy, a God of love a God of justice, a God who is coming for you with a jealous, with a jealous desire that you would be one with him and he with you. 
So uh, as we continue, I, I, I want to pray and then I'm, I, I'm going to invite Pastor Brad to, to come up and we're going to take a moment to, to encounter this Jesus. We're going to take a moment um, for this Jesus to come and encounter us and, and know this, that it is his will, it is his will tonight. It, it is his desire uh, tonight that, that we would encounter him that we would have an experience with him tonight that would leave us changed forever. And, and just so you know, uh, that's not something that's, that's going to happen. This is something that has already begun. The word tonight has opened up an encounter portal. It is in our hearts. And now we're going to take that a little bit further. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come right now. Reveal the Son. Reveal this ancient of days. Reveal this lover of our soul. Would you just invite him to, to come tonight? Just say, Holy Spirit, come. Catch us up tonight. Rapture us up tonight. Oh, we want to know you. We want to see you. If we see you, we'll be like you. Come, Lord Jesus. Just go ahead and just lift up your hands uh, all through this room tonight. Just lift up your hands tonight as Pastor Brad is coming. Jesus, I thank you that tonight is the night that you are going to reveal yourself to us in a life-changing way.